1 Samuel chapter 14. I'm going to read from the New International Version. Before we read the text, I started saying, you know, it's a choice. You know, it's a choice. We didn't have to linger in worship for an hour, which we did. We just did, basically. It was a choice. Whose choice was it? Well, it was yours. You came. And it was mine. 1 Samuel 14. Thank you, beloved wife. It's a choice. We, we all make choices every day. You know, leadership, leadership can either usher in God's presence or shut down God's presence. Leadership, and, and we're all leaders. You said, no, I'm not a leader. Yeah, you're leading your life, I hope. If you're not, somebody will lead it for you. We all make choices every day to get up and, and pray and seek his face or not. I made a choice today. I drank black coffee. Instead, of uh, heavy cream and sugar-free vanilla. So I went, I went for black coffee today. But that's not what I did yesterday. Some days I have as many as 10 shots of espresso. That, that is my max. Not at once. I have a choice. And... It's called the glory of man, 1 Samuel 14. We'll, we'll read it in a moment. We have a choice. So God speaks to you. God speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us in many different ways. And then you get to choose whether you're going to obey or not. And he doesn't make you do it. I remember early on, and my beautiful mother, who's on the second row, She taught me this. She uh, just taught me to be sensitive to God's voice, and I'm still learning. Is there anybody else that's still learning? But literally, there are times that God tells me what clothes to wear. It doesn't always make sense. And I have known, I have known folks that are a little bit weird about that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We all have choices. 1 Samuel 14, if you're there, say, Ooh. I'm so glad I didn't give you any notes. So, Something the Lord spoke to me, and I've chosen this text to preach to you from, is that when you speak to mountains, mountains move. How many of you know that? Okay. But then there are those that seem to stay put. Isn't that irritating? Speak to the mountain, to the mountain, speak to the mountain, move. And no matter how many times you sang that song, no matter how many times you pointed and spoke mountainese, because mountains don't speak English, you speak to inanimate objects, speak to things that are immovable. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to this mountain to be thrown up and moved into the sea. And there's all kinds of testimonies, actually, about mountains moving. I, I, I'd have to go look at that. I think it's in Fox's Book of Martyrs. There's this first century... Uh, or second century believer, and he was going to be, he was going to die. And I'm doing a horrible job of paraphrasing. I'll look it up. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the full story, but, but enjoy the paraphrase because it's close. So he's going to lose his head unless the mountain moves. And so they gather everybody and they're mocking him and they're saying, yeah, okay, seed is a, you know, faith is a mustard seed. Go ahead, Junior, move the, move the stinking mountain. Because if you don't move the mountain, you're getting a decappuccino. 
so he prays and it's something like he said I need to pray give me three hours so he prays and there's an earthquake and literally it moved and they all fell in awe of God and great fear hit the place and there was global revival. I, I don't know what happened after that, but I mean, he didn't lose his head. But there are those mountains where no matter how many times you speak, no matter how many times you prophesy, no how many times you come into his presence, it doesn't melt, it doesn't move. Those are irritating. Because there's something that's being put in you through that obstacle that will not be put in you if it just was moved. And so there are some mountains that move by faith and other ones, you better get on your, your, your climbing shoes, get yourself a faith, a faith rope and start climbing because it builds character. It puts things in you that would not be in you any other way. And I said this uh, recently, uh, I'm going to say it again, our building project has taken twice easily, twice as long as I would have desired. And, and that might be generous. I mean, I wanted, we, I, we wanted, we needed this thing, we needed this six years ago when we started. So here we are six years later, moving on seven. I find encouragement in the fact that the temple was built in seven years. Come on, somebody say amen. But something has been put in me, and I'm going to go ahead and say this. Something has been put in you. Something has been put in us that would not be there had we not climbed that mountain. And if you think the enemy just wants to roll over and have a big old church full of thousands of people witnessing to everybody and a, and a great revival, if you think he's all down for that, you're mistaken. So there's obstacles and there's mountains that you have to climb. The story is this ancient story of Jonathan. I've preached from numerous times before. Find verse 1 of 1 Samuel 14. One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to the young man bearing his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. I think he thought forgiveness is better than permission right there. His father, his father was, had already caved to public pressure. His father was a man pleaser. His father was in fear, and all of Israel was in fear. And some young man named Jonathan wakes up and says, You know something? Skip this, man. I'm going to do something. Has anybody had a moment like that where you, it's just like somebody needs to do something and you grit your teeth and charge no matter what the cost. I, uh, I have some fellow beekeepers in the room, so I'm sure there's a better way than what I just did, but I harvested all my honey and um, and that was very exciting. Um, and then I went to feed one of my hives with sugar syrup. So I won't get into all of that, preparing two of my hives to make it through the winter. So I'm out there with about six gallons of sugar syrup. And I have a bee veil on, some blue jeans, a heavy denim shirt. And I use gloves this time of the year, mostly during the middle of the summer when the flow is on, they're very nice. But I just rip them off of all their honey. Yeah, so they're not so nice. But I'm figuring I'm, I'm good. I, I got it. I go to this hive and I pull the first box off. I, I have a unique way of putting sugar syrup on and basically I've got a put sugar syrup on the bottom. There's a lot of people use different techniques. I lift the first box off, and it sounds like a 454 big block. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, you know, it's semi-intimidating. I'm like, whoa, that's, that's intense. 
So I put that box down. I pick up the second box, which is bubbling with bees. Thousands. I don't know how many in a box. How many in a box, Rick? 60,000 approximately in one box. Okay, so there's four. Four boxes. Do the math. Again, administrative people, you can do the math, and you can give me the list of the announcements. Amen. So I pick up the second box, and literally, I don't know, it's probably 40 pounds plus. It's still got some honey bars in it. And anyway, it shakes violently. I'm, it pick, I pick it up. It shakes violently, and all of the bees, all of them, all of them empty the hive and attack me. No problem. I've got bee equipment on. They can sting through in the fall. Like It's fall, by the way. In the fall, I'm convinced they can sting through anything. They hit me, a, a unified attack, on the honey thief. They hammer me. My bee veil breaks. Like, I don't even know how that happens. So I've got bees inside my bee veil. I'm like, ah! I put the thing down. I look at my jeans. And literally, I can hardly see any blue jeans. Because all I see is sting, bees stinging my legs. And I feel it. But it's not a full sting. It's like a half sting. You know what I'm talking about? It's like a half sting. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? You don't want to know. It almost made me hate beekeeping. I got so, I got so beat down. And here's what happened. I'm going to tie it into the text. Hang in. Hang on a second. I know you guys like stories. So, so I sc I'm screaming. This has happened for over the past, <laughs> Pastor Karen. She usually videos and laughs, so it's payback for all my little wisecracks from church or something. I, she's like, it's seed time and harvest, honey. So, and I don't mean just on the front of my legs. Literally everywhere I'm getting stung, everywhere. And so I, I run, which is a good thing to do. And as I'm running, again, it's like the cartoon. I'm running, and I, I'm like, ah! I look over, cloud behind me. <laughs> no, really, that's real. That's real, that happens. It happened to me. All I can think is, I can't, I can't, even if I kill all the bees that are on me and stop them from stinging me, that's not even a drop in the bucket to what's chasing me. It's not even remotely close. There's only probably hundreds or a couple thousand. We're talking tens of thousands of bees blacken the sky. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. All I can think is, ah, ah, put on your other suit. So I went, I got my suit while I'm getting stung and my bee veil's broken and I, I, mean, I got stung in the lip and stung in the ear and I'm getting stung everywhere. And I put my other suit on top of my clothes because I figure now they can't sting through two layers of fabric, which is true. And then I figure once I get my suit on, I can kill all the ones that are stinging me, and it's going to be all right. So, no, it worked. It worked out. And then, and then I got to this place where I was, I was under control. I was just getting stung periodically, periodically, as opposed to full sting all the time. You know, and then I got like this, I got like semi-PTSD right now. <laughs> it's terrible. It's worse with hair. Way worse. Way worse. Gets caught in your hair, and you just wait to get stung, and you wait, and you wait, and finally it gets you. I don't have that problem. I'm calling for Pastor Karen to help me. She's doing something else. Here goes the tie-in to the text. I'm still getting stung a little bit, and I look back at those bees, and I said, in the name of Jesus. And I, I went back, I gripped my teeth, 
and put that thing back together, put the sugar syrup on it. But, and, and it was bad. I mean, it was really ugly. And I was like, I was like, I made a choice to go finish what I had to do. And they better make it through the winter or I'm going to kill them. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Jonathan wakes up. One, one morning, he wakes up and says, that's it. Somebody needs to do something about those ugly, uncircumcised, and I love how he says that in Scripture, those without covenant is what that means. The uncircumcised Philistines. I'm going to go and deal with them. He goes to the Philistine camp. Well, this is an amazing story. Come let us go over to the Philistines' outpost on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Look at verse 2. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah under the pomegranate tree, chilling, eating pomegranates. There were about 600 men, <laughs> among whom is some guy I can't pronounce, and uh, he was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother. Does anybody know who Ichabod was? Ichabod is the guy that um, he was born when the ark was captured by the Philistines. So Ichabod means the glory is departed. I mean, Israel's in a lot of trouble here. And God touches this guy, Jonathan, the son of the king. No one is aware that Jonathan left. That's my way of skipping the, word, the words I can't pronounce. Look at verse 4. On each side of the path that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes, the other was Senna. Everybody say Senna. You're a Senna. No, I said that. Okay. And those names have meaning and it's significant and I'm not going there. Verse 5. One cliff stood to the north towards Michmash. The other stood to the south towards Gibeah. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come let us go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. I love how it says that. He, he's, got, it is, he's got it in his heart to do something for God. He's got it in his heart to do something against the enemy. He's got it in his heart to deal with these people that have terrorized his family, that have the ark. He has it in his heart to do something. I'm going to tell you that I don't care how old you are. If you get some faith to do something for God, something's going to happen. If you get some faith in your heart to do, it doesn't matter if you're educated, uneducated. It doesn't matter what kind of background you come from. It doesn't matter if you come from a long line of preachers or prostitutes. It does not matter. If you get some faith to do something for God, it's going to be released. His power will be released. I believe God's raising up a bunch of Jonathans. So they go on, oh, the uncircumcised fellows, when it says uncircumcised, know for certain that that means they're people without covenant. They, the enemy of Israel has no covenant. God is with Israel if he's with them. Now, if, if he isn't with Israel, then he's not with them. When he was with them, the shout of the king would be among them. But David has faith and believes that God's going to help him. Look what he does. He and his armor bearer. And in certain cultures, you know, and even here, we have, we have people that assist and help, and I'm so grateful for that. That's not what an armor bearer was in the Old Testament. Armor bearer in the Old Testament carried the actual armor and was in a very close relationship with the, with the warrior, with the, those that, and whoever he was serving, and it was a discipleship mentoring uh, thing. Closer than we, they, they ate together, they, 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 they hiked together, they did everything together, they fought together. The other interesting thing to note at this time, do you know that Israel has no blacksmiths? This is fascinating. What do you mean they had no blacksmiths? That literally what the enemy did is took all the blacksmiths away. Why? So they wouldn't have any swords. They had no weapons. Well, Jonathan has a weapon and his father Saul has a weapon, but you'll see his armor bearer gets like a little... A little, um, you know, a little knife, a little dagger, or something like that. How'd you like to be in a knife fight? Pardon me, a sword fight, and you're like, that, that's kind of the picture. Let 
Jonathan said, verse 6, to his young arm bearer, come, let's go over to these fellow uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. I love that. Nothing can hinder. You should underline this. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. The battle does not go to the strong. The battle does not go to the wise. The battle does not go to the wealthy. The battle does not go to the good looking. It doesn't go to the ugly. The battle goes to the Lord. And whoever walks with the Lord, fights with the Lord, that's who the battle goes to. doesn't go to anybody else. So it, it, it's not by many. It's not by few. It's by those who are in covenant. Do all that you have in your mind, as Armour Burr said. What a joy. It's a joy to work and serve with people that are like, let's go. That's who you are. I want to say thank you. You're like, let's do it. Build that crazy building. Let's go. When I first got here, we did a thing called Hell House. We were written up in the newspaper, and they called us Brackenites. No, seriously. Which is sort of cute because of the Brennanite thing that was happening really strong back then, 15 years ago. Some of you know about that. Others of you, don't worry. Just move on. Serve God. Come on to somebody say, serve God. <laughs> I remember at that time somebody said, hey, pastor, I'm going to shave my head too. I said, please don't. <laughs> Why not? I said, because let's just get through this little sticky spot right here. Let's get rid of the Brackenite thing. Can you imagine everybody shaving their head? Hey, let's go to King's. I'd go get a toupee. That's what I'd do right away. <laughs> I'd lay hands and grow hair. What a joy to work with people that are like, let's do it. That's what his armor bearer says, let's go. Come on, someone say, let's go. Let's go. And you need to partner with people that have a let's go in them. Partner with people that are willing to do things for God that don't make sense. It made no sense for them to do it. And yet his armor bearer said, let's go. Come, we'll cross over towards the men. Look at verse 8. If they say to us, wait, wait there, we'll come to you. We will stay where we are, and we will not go up. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up, because that will be our sign. <laughs> That'll be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Okay, if you go and look at this, do you know what kind of climb this is? It's a... The scholars say it's, it's pretty much a vertical climb of about 1,700 feet. And if you go and look, it says that they climb with their hands and feet, which means they're not holding any, they're not holding their, their weaponry. So the, the shield's probably on his back. They're climbing up. And the Philistines are probably, they're probably pouring chamber pots over them. That's a specific term to not be crude. If you don't know what that, that is, go and Google it. They'll probably have to think, no, don't Google it, don't. I think that the uncircumcised Philistines are throwing things or pouring forth certain kinds of water onto their head. You know, I, I think they're, yeah, and they have to go, does anybody, 1,700 feet. Okay, so there's one guy says, no, it's 1,400, whatever. I remember doing the Shaswang Gunks in New Pulse, New York, 400 feet. 400-foot cliff that we would hide, climb with ropes and all of that. They had to climb up by hand. Let's just call it a 1,000, all right? a 1,000 feet. Do you know how hard that is? And by the way, strategically, if you're approaching somebody, strategically, in a fight, military strategy, the person who has the high ground is clearly going to win. This is like the stupidest fleece ever. Can you imagine the armor bearer? All right, if they say come up, we're going to climb up. What? We're going to climb up the cliff. If they say come up to us, and then we'll know. That'll be our sign that God's, gonna, God's with us. He's like, seriously? And they, and they climb up. The Lord has given them into our hands. Verse 11, both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes that they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. Jonathan said, "Woo, yeah! 
It doesn't really say that, but it, it kind of seems like that to me. He said, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into my hand. You know the armor bearer is like biting his lip or something. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet, so he's not guarding from any rocks or anything that's being thrown. His armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan, so he gets to the top and he enters the battle. And his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In the first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area about, of about half an acre. Look at verse 15. Then panic struck the whole army. Those in the camp and in the field and those in the outposts and raiding parties and the ground shook. shook. What happened to the ground? There's an earthquake. What are you saying? I'm telling you, it was a panic sent by God. I have a word from the Lord for you tonight. That if you will climb that mountain that seems so difficult, the one that, that doesn't move, if you will go towards that thing led by God with wisdom and a multitude of counsel, biblically attacking it, all right? I don't know how else how to say that. God will shake and give you favor and you will win. Why will you win? Because you have a covenant. You're not just some person. Come on, God wants to save your whole family. God wants to intervene in your life. He wants to intervene in your business. I'm going to share a story from uh, uh, one of our congregants here, a dear friend, and I'll leave the name out. Their property was being destroyed and shot up in downtown Anchorage. Glass being broken. So, Texted me, I'm getting my guns and I'm going to Anchorage. I'm like, what? Exclamation point. Like, what are you thinking? You don't get your guns and go to Anchorage. I had some other emergency happen right then. And I just entrusted the Lord to, I just entrusted them to the Lord that it would not take their guns and go to Anchorage. In other words, I'm going to cap the people that are shooting my building up every night. No, that, that's a bad idea. Yeah, I think that was probably his flesh. Amen. And I found out what he did. Or I should say what they did. Instead of go and shoot them, which is, you know, that's good. That would be murder. He bought a whole bunch of food, went down to where his building is, fed all the homeless, and ministered to everybody. And now he has like a homeless squad that protects his building. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing something that's totally other than what your normal, natural mind would think. God will give you ideas. God will speak to you. It doesn't make sense to climb a cliff that's 1,700, 1,400, okay, a thousand feet. It makes no sense to do that, to go up to the high grounds. And two guys, one with a knife. A little knife. One sword. 20 guys. Trained soldiers. But they, they had a word from the Lord. They put a fleece. Let me just tell you this about fleeces. I don't really so much believe about fleeces. I, I don't believe in fleeces so much. You know what I mean? You don't know. Okay, so the, the whole fleece thing, I'm going to put a fleece out before the Lord. Some of you guys that have been in the way a long time understand clearly what a fleece is. It comes from the story of Gideon. And so the angel talks to Gideon, and, and Gideon's not sure it's God, and he's a little concerned. So he gets a piece of fleece, which is lamb's wool. And, he, and, and you go read it. It's in the book of Judges. And he puts it out, and he says, Now, when I wake up in the morning, again, I'm paraphrasing. If there's water all around and the fleece is dry, I'll know. Well, that happens, and then he does it in reverse. If I wake up in the morning, the fleece is wet and the ground is dry. So God does all of those things. It's like, oh, my gosh, it's God. And so when you hear, I'm putting a fleece out, that's what that comes from. That's where that comes from. Okay, I don't really believe in doing that. Let God speak to you. Okay, l let, me, let me say this, though. I do believe in signs. I do believe in God confirming. 
I do believe in God giving me a sign and speaking to me. And here's what I've found. Signs always come to the faith-filled, but they never come to the doubter. So when, so when you're looking for God to confirm what he said to you in your heart and you start moving forward, baby, you're going to see some water up on that fleece. But if you're like, well, I don't know. I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. I ain't gonna do, unless, you know, he shows me a sign. Yeah, you don't get any. God will always release a sign to, to the faithful. So if someone's full of faith moving forward, you always get signs. Someone's full of doubt. Many times you don't. And of course, God can override that because he's God and he can do whatever he wants to whoever he wants to anytime he likes. Amen. That's a definition of sovereign. He does what he wants, when he wants, to whoever he wants to. Is there anybody in here? Lift your hands to heaven and say, I'm going to be the faith-filled guy. Come on, someone say, let's go. Come on, I'm going I'm to take my mountain. Say it. Come on, I'm going to climb my mountain. I'm going to obey God. Give him praise in the house of God right now. All right. Let me give you a few things here. And what's fascinating to me is that his step of faith basically was a catalyst to release the power of God. And I want to tell you some of the things that I've heard just about our step of faith with our building. And, oh, and it has been. It has released courage to those who want to build. It's released strength. It's like it shook the ground somehow. And, and God gets all the praise. That's for certain. Because we're really not quite sure how any of it's happening. We just pray, obey, cry out, fast, pray, do it over again. Give, serve, do everything we know to do. Jesus, help us, help us, help us, oh God. Help us finish, move in with grace, grace, shouting. I'm going to tell you that first service, I'm going to be piled up. I'm going to pile up. I'm going to pile up, weeping up in the front. I'm, we, I, weep, I weep regularly about it anyway. You should see the place. It's amazing. No, no, no. No, you didn't get what I was saying. It's amazingly beautiful. Beautiful. Let me give you a couple things here. What made Jonathan a catalyst is he had a desire to do something for God. If you want to take notes, write that down. Number one, have a desire to do something for God. If you want to take your mountain, you want to make a difference, you want to make an impact, you want to fulfill your destiny and purpose, the first step is having a desire to do it. Just having the desire. Desire is a seedbed of miracles. And if you'll have a desire... I. I, I used to dream about doing something for the Lord. I knew it was impossible in my head, like, like that'll never happen. Oh, but I want to do something. And then years later, you know, standing going, what, seriously? I know John Duke knows what I'm talking about. Kicked out of counseling. When your counseling kick, your counselor kicks you out, you know you got issues. We can't counsel you anymore. You're not counselable. Is that a word? <laughs> How'd you like to have that? And yet, now he offers counsel to many. Have a desire. What he did, he picked a fight. Listen, don't, don't, I, I, uh, fear. I, I hate fear. If you know me, I just had a situation. I just had a situation with Dr. Morocco who, who, uh, he challenged me. And when he challenged me, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, that you, you probably can't do that. I said, excuse me? I said, did, did, you, did you just say that to me? Uh, that, 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 that's like a straight picking a fight for me. When somebody says, I can't, okay, I can let it go if it's the flesh, and I can let it go if it's a competition or whatever. I can let it go most of the time. Amen. But if it's the Lord that tells me to do it, and then somebody says I can't, I'm extremely motivated. To me, that's just like, wow, you just chummed the waters. Let's go. Come on, somebody say, let's go. He had a desire. He picked a fight with the Philistines. 
He knew God's plan was to win. Do you know God's plan for you is to win? Just like it was for Jonathan. God's plan for you is to walk in victory. God's plan for you is to be an overcomer. God, I read the back of the book. We win. God's plan for us is to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we can ask or imagine. I can imagine a lot. Get that in your mind. God's for you, not against you. He's not angry. He's not angry at you. He made a way through his son. And Jonathan knew that. His thought was, man, how can I beat these uncircumcised fools? Not, how can I protect myself? There are some, I, oh man, I almost said something and got myself in trouble. <laughs> Ooh, James at work right there. The man who's in control of his tongue is in control of his entire being. Self-preservation will never expand the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you, I am not going to yield to fear. I am going to lead you by the grace of Almighty God with an amazing team, fearlessly, courageously conquering everything that's in our way, including COVID-19, including everything, anything, and, and whatever the next, whatever the next woo-ha thing comes. Oh, it's not the last one. You've got to li live your life uncompromised with a clear conscience. And that's having a clear conscience is key. But don't let your conscience be mine. My conscience is mine. I'm going to obey my conscience. You obey yours. We live in a free country. I'm so close. Pastor Karen's praying in tongues. If she's, if she's not, start. We better move on. But I just want to say one more time. <laughs> Self-preservation is the enemy of the kingdom. If you're constantly trying to protect yourself, you will never charge hell with a water pistol if God calls you to. You will never go up the mountain with the fire and the knife if you're trying to just protect your little world. And let me just tell you that most Christians are trying to protect their little kuleana. That's Hawaiian word for stuff. Trying to, protect their, trying to protect their things so that nobody takes it. I got news for you. They'll take it eventually. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Halle Come on, everybody, sing with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, sing it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo -hoo. <laughs> Woo! Come on, say, I'm not going to yield to fear. Say it. I will not yield to fear. Say it again. I will not yield to fear. Come on, if you deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow him, not preserve yourself. Amen. Baby's getting touched by the Lord. I think Jonathan knew the power of God. And he certainly, as I've mentioned before, had the privilege of being in unity. His armor bearers with him. You know, they don't go out one by one. They were sent out two by two. And you'll see that principle throughout Scripture. Who is your armor bearer? Who is your Jonathan? Who are you partnered with? Who is, everybody needs some crazy friends. Crazy friends. Come on, who is it that would drag that guy to the rooftop and rip off the roof tiles and lower him in? Do you have anybody like that? You'd be like, no, wait, you can't touch the roof tiles because that's someone's roof. I mean, Jesus is in there. Chuck is going to die. Let's lower him into the truck. No. Okay, you're out. Let me get someone else that's crazy. That was wrong because it was personal property. They never should have broken into the roof. There's a higher law at work sometimes. That's what I quote when I'm speeding to my wife. He was the opposite of his father.
You know, I love my dad, and I respect him deeply. He was not, he was not a man of God like, like others I know. He did the best he could, and, and he did a great job, and I'm so grateful for him. But he wasn't, he wasn't someone who was taking nations like that. But I do believe that he did what he felt like the Lord wanted him to do. He has his own relationship with the Lord. I'm so glad he wasn't a Saul. And before we, before we castigate Saul, he was the first one to create a standing army. I mean, Saul, was, Saul did amazing things. I don't know what kind of background you came from or what your father was like or your mother was like, but you can connect with people who will inspire you. And, and fire you up and feed you. Come on, you're on Wednesday night. The church is packed to capacity on a Wednesday night. I, I'm not going past 9 o'clock, so just, unless, of course, I do. Get with people that inspire you. And, and, and for God's sake, fathers, don't be souls. Model what it is to be a man of faith. Model what it is to be a, a woman of faith, mom. All right. This is a famous uh, quote, and I'll have to look it up where it comes from, but it, it's man's extremity is always God's opportunity. I've said it for 20 years. I heard my pastor say it many, many years ago. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. I want you to say that. Man's extremity is God's Extremity means whatever extreme thing you're facing, you're in, is an opportunity for God to turn that thing into the greatest miracle you have ever seen. Your problem is a springboard to propel you into greater faith. Quit looking at every wind and wave. Quit, come on, quit belly aching. Then looking at all the molehills. You know what? It was a mountain for me years ago. I look at that thing. And I, the problems that were just so enormous many years ago. Now they're like, <laughs> walk right over that thing. I was almost frozen and crippled by this, this giant mountain. That, that mountain now is a molehill. And so here's what I've found. Get near people that have overcome. Get with people. Serve with people that know how to conquer, know how to take territory. Serve with people who know how to be a father, know how to be a mother. Serve with people who know how to have faith, know how to pray through. Praying through. Praying through. Pray to you. Come through the other side. I like hanging with people like that. And I've learned, and I'm still learning. The greatest thing, I've, I just remembered it today, and the Lord touched me through the experience. All these years later, 20 plus years later, that's ah, probably 19. We buy this shopping center in Oahu. The payment on it is, I'm guessing, I'm close, $164,000 a month. We have no church, but we're going to put one there. Why? Because God told us to. Let me tell you who does that. No one. Why? It's crazy. But God. So Dr. Morocco flies in all of his staff from all the outer island extensions, and we meet on Oahu, and we meet in the deli section. I'm pastoring on Molokai, I think, with my lovely wife and children. And we're meeting, he says, okay, the papers are signed. This is now ours. I want you, and, and it's a shopping center. It's, it's a, like a Ralph's shopping center or something. Times supermarket. And people are everywhere. They're still buying food. It's still a supermarket, but we now own it, you know, in 30 days kind of thing. But it's signed. And so he says, so I want you to walk up and down the aisles and just pray. Pray. All right? And he said, yeah. He says, all right, go. We're like, okay. So I walk off, and I'm praying. I'm like, shaka, ta, wow, shopping center. But I'm thinking to myself, well, this is kind of neat. Huh? Maybe I'll get a snack on the way out. You know what I mean? It, it, <laughs> no, it's not, it's not sit, the thing's not sitting squarely on top of my shoulders. Dad bought it. Yeah, Dad got it. How'd you get that? Dad. So as I'm, I'm walking, I walk past an aisle, and I, I look down the aisle, and I see Dr. Morocco. 
Listen. He's about 25% down the aisle, and there's nobody with him. And I thought, as I see him, I stop, and I'm like, wow, Dad, I wonder what, it li- what, is, wonder what it's like to put everything on the line. We all knew everything was on the line, but it's not on my line. I'm good. My wife loves me. It doesn't work. I'll be okay. But it's totally on him. And I looked, I thought, dude, that, that looks like some weight. Like, I could almost see it in the spirit. So I hustle up next to him. And I'm, I'm walking with him. We're walking together. I'm like, hey, doctor. He's like, what? I said, uh, just want to know, how are you feeling right now? He says, that's irrelevant. I'm like, listen to that. How are you feeling while you're climbing your cliff? It's irrelevant. How are you feeling while you're coming up on 20 people, insurmountable, and, you're, and how are you feeling as the armor bearer? How are you feeling? 20 people. You fight 20 people with this. And the crazy, disobedient son. Feelings. Feelings. Something more than feelings. I don't remember the rest of the song. My God, what's going on around here? He says, that's irrelevant. We, he uses a line from Star Trek. It's irrelevant. We are engaged. That's what he said. By walking with men like that, whatever was on them, I got some of it. And I found that as I hang out with visionaries and I hang out with, I spend time with or, or learn from, and, I'm, and there's so many resources on, on, online And for God's sake, don't listen to some strange, offshoot, rabbit trail, unendorsed, false teacher. Well, do you know they're false? Well, the the point is you don't know. So you need to know the word. And and, and there's ear-tickling stuff and all kinds of stuff going on out there. So, you know, the problem with online teaching is you don't know the life behind that person. And that's the problem. But there are those that I listen to that deeply inspire me. Why would I do that? Because I'm going I'm to I'm climb the cliff and I'm going to kill Philistines. That's why, in the spirit. We're, we're going to take territory. Can you say amen? Man's extremity is always God's opportunity. If you'll obey God, God will come through for you and it'll be glorious. If you want to live the life that God has for you, that you see in scripture, then you've got to walk like other people aren't willing to walk. Tithe, give, pray, serve. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Obey God. Pray through. Get going. Serve with all your heart. I want to say this one more point, and then we'll wrap this. If I could have keys, please. I think that he knew that God was going to help him, and he had this fleece kind of thing. He asked for a sign, and again, I think that's good. God, give give me a sign. It's always good to ask God, confirm what I'm doing right now. Lord, continue to speak to me. I mean, every morning, Lord, show me. Show me, God. Show me. Speak to me. If there's anything out of order, God, reveal to me. If I have any sin in my life, God, would you expose it? If we need to change anything, God, with the building, would you show us? Show us. Speak to us. My family, my son, my my wife, my, my daughter, my finances. God, show me. I mean, we live that way. If you live that way, you'll walk in blessings that are beyond anything you could imagine. And so God gives him this incredible breakthrough. But he had to take action. Take action. Don't just believe God. Listen, faith is acting on what God's word says. Wiped out the whole outpost. He released the power of God and he inspired others. What would happen if you lived your best life every day for God? Who would you impact? I'll tell you who. Every single person that knows you. How do you know that? Because I've I've seen it in my own life and I see it with countless of lives of the people that come here. They come and they're like, when I walked in, when I drove on the parking lot, I felt God's... I've heard this story 
many times, all kinds of different people. I felt God's presence when I, when I drove onto the parking lot. And when I walked through those doors, it was like a wind. Something hit me. Man, what's going on in this place? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, we give him all the praise. And their lives get transformed. And then before you know it, their neighbor's with them. Hey, this is my neighbor. You know why neighbor's with them? Because they see something on Bubba. And then before you know it, it's not just a neighbor now. Now the wife or the husband's coming. You're like, she was like Satan's sister, and I don't know what happened. She, I'm coming now. Something got to be real here. I'm coming because he was Jack the Ripper and he is just the greatest man now. Over and over and over, you are an inspiration. That is God's plan. You're to be an inspiration to everybody that knows you. When they look at you, they go, whoa, must be God. Because I remember them. They were just messed up. They were toe up from the flow up. But look at now. There is a release of God's power upon us to live for Him. And in obeying God, it releases His power for those that are weak, those that are hurting, those that are in the clefts of the rock. The Israelites, the shaking happens. There's panic released by God. And all the Israelites come out to battle and the whole thing is turned because one guy and his armor bearer with the little knife said, let's go. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior, and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today, and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life, and I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.